A city man claims he's been subjected to harassment by Thunder Bay police. A Thunder Bay nonprofit food group hit by a damaging theft. And the deadly violence continues in Egypt. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A city man who has taken the Thunder Bay Police Service to both the police watchdog and the Human Rights Tribunal says he feels he's being targeted by police. Richard Burns has had success in both of his earlier cases against members of the local force. And throughout that period, he alleges he's had as many as 100 run-ins with police. As Dennis Ward reports, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director will once again conduct an investigation. Richard Burns alleges he's being harassed by the Thunder Bay Police Service and says he has been for more than a decade. Burns believes the compensation he received from a human rights case against the force is behind many encounters with police. He also believes that's why he was arrested in 2011. That incident led to a Thunder Bay Police disciplinary hearing, which resulted in two officers being found guilty of unlawful exercise of authority. Since that ruling, Burns says he's had as many as 20 encounters with police. Traffic stops. Um, three of these encounters resulted in them coming to my home. Um, most recently on July the 16th. Um, and there were suggestions that the uh, vehicle that I was driving was going to be seized, which had, had previously occurred and required a superior court action, uh, forcing the police to release the vehicle and cover the vast majority of the storage and towing charges for it. Burns claims he's had two dozen tickets issued to him for traffic offenses, and he claims all of them have been thrown out or cancelled, but he believes the tickets are just a tool of harassment. None of Burns' most recent claims have been proven in court. However, the Office of the Independent Police Review Director sent Burns a letter earlier this week stating they will investigate his latest claims into the conduct of the local police service. However, Burns still feels there is a failure in the process. It's up to the OIPRD and the Human Rights Tribunal to ensure that people who access the system are not um, becoming victims of reprisals. Uh, so that if you file a police complaint, uh, suddenly you're being pulled over, your roommates are being pulled over. Thunder Bay Police will not comment on Burns' complaint or the OIPRD investigation, but Police Association President Greg Stevenson says if that investigation leads to a panel hearing, he's confident their members will be exonerated. He says any charges laid against Burns by their officers are simply a case of them doing their job. Dennis Ward, TBT News. A development that would connect northern Ontario with the rest of the province could face opposition from native groups if the Ontario Energy Board doesn't reconsider a recent decision. Just last week, the OEB chose Upper Canada Transmission as the company to construct the $600 million east-west transmission line from Thunder Bay to Wawa. Officials with the Pick River First Nation are now disputing that choice, saying it's flat out wrong, ignoring the six First Nation communities along the route and their own proposal development for the project. Byron LeClaire is Director of Energy Projects for Pick River he says the decision to move forward with the Florida-based company doesn't make sense. Involvement was ignored, Ontario involvement was ignored. Uh, I don't understand the reasoning behind the decision and uh, I, I think that that's what really precipitated uh, the court challenge that uh, uh, Pick River is going to be uh, advancing uh, in light of this decision. It's been like this for a long time. We've always took a second seat to any development. This one is not going to be, it's going to be different. We will the owners of that. Otherwise, we'll put the kibosh to it. The community is now threatening legal action and injunctions to stop the project until the decision is reviewed or until the chosen company carries out their duty to consult and accommodate the impacted First Nations. Members of the Gall Bay First Nation met last night to hear details of the latest settlement offer from Ontario Power Generation. The Gall Bay Reserve has suffered extensive damage due to the building of dams between 1918 and 1950. Close to 180 band members met at the Valhalla Inn to discuss the latest OPG proposal. Back in 2010, an offer of $10 million was turned down by Chief Wilford King on behalf of Gall Bay. King says last night's membership meeting went well and the new offer will 
will now go to ratification vote as soon as next month. King won't comment on the amount of the settlement, but says there's been a definite increase in the amount. Negotiating with Ontario and Canada are now on the same process, so we're on the same grievance. So this is only one of three, and uh, I am confident that, uh, you know, the community will move ahead and put this behind us. And uh, you know, we had a very good eloquent speak tonight by one of our elders that wanted to see closure to this as well. King says the damage to the land was traumatic for his community, and any settlement funds will be put to good use for the members. The fire that occurred on Pacific Avenue last night is now being treated as an arson. Fire officials say the case is being turned over to police for investigation. The multi-unit house sustained damage to the roof and the exterior. There was also some heat and smoke damage to the inside of the building. Firefighters were called to the scene on the 500 block of Pacific around 11 o'clock last night. Officials say the blaze started in some furniture that was located outside, then spread to the building. Fortunately, there were no injuries and the investigation continues. Garden Co-op responsible for mobile markets around Thunder Bay has been hit by thieves. Roots to Harvest grow their own vegetables and then sell them at transit stops to people with limited income. But their mode of transporting the food is now gone. Just after 8 o'clock this morning, coordinator of the program, Aaron Beagle, arrived to find six bicycles missing. The group usually stores them locked up in the greenhouse at the corner of Cornwall Avenue and Algoma Street. Beagle believes they were stolen out of the window of the greenhouse, but she found the lack of damage to the plants suspicious. And it's also left them scrambling with a week remaining in the mobile markets program. It means a lot more juggling. It means pulling some favors. Um, it means tr like trying to um, make it work to try to continue, and we will continue it, whether we walk down to Water Street Station or what, or take the bus over to City Hall. But... We will make it work one way or the other. We're not going to stop doing mobile markets, but those bikes have a lot more value to us than street value to wherever they are. The organization purchased the used bikes from Bicycles for Humanity with a grant from the United Way. Beagle adds that she'd just like to see the bikes returned. Anyone with information about the theft can contact Thunder Bay Police. The Nishnabiaski Police Service now has a new chief. Terry Armstrong will take the helm as of September. He'll succeed Bob Herman, who's held a position of acting chief since January of this year. Armstrong spent most of his career with the Ontario Provincial Police in the Northwest region. He was also a First Nations constable in Pakanjikum for three years prior to becoming an OPP officer. Armstrong retired from the OPP in 2010 and was most recently a deputy chief with the Treaty 3 Police Service near Kenora. He will assume his new role with NAPS effective September 3rd. There are more headaches for drivers who use Nebing Avenue. The street was closed for most of last summer due to underground reconstruction. And now drivers are once again having to find alternate routes due to more road closures. A portion of Nebing Avenue has been closed to complete paving and underground wo road work. Project engineer Rick Harm says drivers are asked to follow the detours around the construction project. Over the winter, there had been some ownership changes on the west side of Nebing Avenue and the owners had approached the city to install sanitary services, sanitary sewer for new lot development. And so that is currently underway prior to paving. And that's not all for Nebing Avenue. Starting next week, the road will be closed for four days between Broadway Avenue and Montreal Street for rehabilitation of the railway crossings. A group of seven Thunder Bay delegates left today for a week-long Sister Cities trip to China. The delegation includes Sister Cities Chair Aldo Roberto, City Clerk John Hannum, Development Manager Mark Smith, City Mining Manager John Mason, Communications Director Karen Lewis, Local Tai Chi Master Peng Yu, and Confederation College Research Director Colin Kelly. The group left this morning for our sister city, Jiazuo, China. They'll return on August 26th. It's a milestone for one of the city's high schools. Hammershold High is celebrating 50 years of teaching with a reunion that is bringing together familiar faces and old friends. The reunion committee is expecting around 1,000 people to once again walk through those doors and reconnect. The three-day event kicked off this afternoon as former students got a chance to check out memorabilia from the past. The reunion features numerous indoor and outdoor events around the city. There will also be school tours, a Saturday night dance, golfing and many other activities. The reunion committee consists of many former teachers from Hammershold. Jerry Gormley spent over 32 years teaching law, sociology and history at the school. It was really kind of neat to be back in this place. The nice thing was I didn't have to obey any uh, bell patterns. I just did it on my own. And it was really nice to be back in the place where I spent so much of my working life. 
and it was just fun to be here. People want to reconnect with old friends, people want to reconnect with former staff members, and people want to see their old school. I mean, the school has been in the city uh, for 50 years, and people are proud of it, and uh, you can see that uh, people are excited to come in. I can see people uh, already uh, connecting with friends that they haven't seen in a long time. The reunion wraps up Sunday with a buffet brunch at Lakehead University. Chippewa Park is literally going to the dogs this weekend. Dogs and their owners are competing at the ninth annual Agility Trials. And pets of all breeds will be competing for ribbons and for bragging rights. Labradors, Border Collies, even a Bulldog had their moment in the sun while running the course. Now these types of Agility Trials have been taking place in the city for more than 20 years. Event organizer Michelle Schulzke has been taking the reins of this competition at Chippewa for nine years now. She believes that dog agility helps to prolong the lives of their furry little friends while being a lot of fun at the same time. I think the main reason they come is because they want to um, build on the relationship with their dogs and to come out and have fun with their dogs. And I mean, that's why we're here. If you're not here to have fun, there's no point in being here. It's a fun thing to do with your dog. Uh, the dogs love it. I have... Uh four dogs and they all do agility. I don't compete with the younger ones, but I do have another boy who's 10 who's going to be competing in the jumpers. Now the event continues again at 9 in the morning, both tomorrow and Sunday. Some ordinary individuals got to become superheroes today. The second annual Easter Seals Drop Zone had participants scaling down a 14-story building. And the fun event managed to raise thousands of dollars. Tara Allaire reports. The fundraising event saw participants step outside their comfort zone and face their fears by rappelling 14 stories down Maple Crest Tower. Easter Seals Senior Development Officer Rhonda Harrison says they've doubled their numbers from last year with almost 40 participants. She says someone is rappelling 150 feet every 10 minutes. A very unique opportunity. This is something different, something, you know, pretty much like a once in a lifetime pretty much opportunity and the people going up are a little nervous when they're coming down up but by the time they're down they're relieved they and it's the excitement they're on their little high. Two of those participants were CKPR radios Danny Foresta and Laura Zena. The morning team took on the nerve-wracking challenge knowing the money raised goes directly to helping Easter Seals kids. I honestly was not scared and I had a great hold on that lever and you just control your pace down. I felt great. The scariest part is getting your feet on the edge of the ledge because that's where you lean back and you really trust the ropes. So that's for me is the most crucial part. Once you're there, you're good to go. So except for the height part, which I keep my eyes closed all the way down. <laughs> and not to be outdone, Rock 94 DJ Brad Hilgers also took the plunge today. Another participant, Robin Gould, took on the challenge as one of her 40 significant things to do in her year of 40. Since reaching the milestone, she's gone skydiving, swam with dolphins, and relaxed on a Disney cruise. She said rappelling down a building looked like fun and allowed her to cross two more things off her list. One of my other significant uh, events was raising the money for this because I raised over $2,500. So amazing support from my friends and family, and I just have to thank them so much for making me able to do this today. Lots of, uh, lots of speed, actually. I was, I was happy to get some speed and be able to bounce off a little bit. It was good. Since 2005, nearly 6,000 superheroes across the country have taken part in drop zone events. To date, they've raised more than $10 million for Canadians with disabilities. Tara Allaire, TBT News. Well, at least they had another gorgeous day for it. Uh, not, Matt, not much wind really to speak of, but I imagine even a little bit of wind when you're up that high probably feels like uh, a lot more than it is. Yeah, I, I, you wouldn't catch me doing that, I'm not no, going to no, lie. No. Little scared of heights, not going to lie, <laughs> but uh, and a little bit windy, but not too bad this morning for them. Yesterday was the big uh, newsmaker for Thunder Bay. In fact, we reached a high of 26.3 degrees. We were the hot spot in Ontario. Yeah, we were the hottest spot in all of Ontario, so that beautiful weather finally paying off and, and feeling great. So uh, give yourselves a, a pat on the back, Thunder Bay, for reaching, uh, reaching that high yesterday. Let's have a look what's happening across the region right now. Again, still beautiful conditions for most of the region. 26, uh, 27 in Dryden, 26 in Fort Francis, all the way along the western part of the region. A little bit cloudy up in Red Lake. Uh, now they're seeing that's going to cloud over and continue to cloud over tonight, probably into, into this evening and tomorrow. 
27 degrees in Pickle Lake. Uh, the rest of the region, again, pretty beautiful. Marathon still at 17 degrees with that wind coming from the south, coming off the lake, uh, keeping things a little bit cooler. But for the most part, Greenstone down into Sault Ste. Marie, 26 degrees and mostly sunny skies. Uh, today in Thunder Bay, we hit a high of 27 degrees, mainly sunny. Again, Brian mentioned that wind earlier. We gusted up to 21 kilometers an hour, but that five was earlier this morning. So hopefully uh, yeah, with the rappelling, it wasn't too bad or didn't make anybody too nervous uh, up there. Uh, tonight, uh, movie nights are back at Marina Park. Yes, Prince Arthur is landing tonight. Uh, back to the Future 2 is your feature film this evening. The sun has been setting around nine o'clock. So they're gonna start the movie around dusk. So again, the last few nights had to look it up, but the sun's been setting about nine, 10 after nine, quarter after nine. So get down there early enough to get a good seat for that one. Going to be another good movie, and the temperature is going to be beautiful. 19 should be about 17, 16 degrees by the time the movie finishes. But that wind is going to come, again, south off the lake, so you might be best off bringing uh, an extra blanket or an extra sweatshirt in case, uh, in case it does cool down just a little bit. Uh, this evening, overnight, we're going to drop down to 12. A few clouds, but again, mainly clear. Wind's uh, not going to be uh, too much of a factor this evening. And moving uh, into the first part of your weekend tomorrow, that hot surge, it's going to come all the way up into the region. Jet stream is going to be just above Thunder Bay. We could see a few showers uh, into Sunday, but the other parts of the region will have some showers uh, possibly tomorrow. I'll have more on that coming up later in the news hour. All right, thanks very much, Matt. Well, more deadly violence in Egypt today in a country that many believe is now poised on the brink of civil war. We have details on that story and more for you as your news hour continues. Soon, in the thousands, they converged on central Cairo. Soon, the violence many feared
Security officials in Egypt say the death toll in clashes today across the country now stands at 60 and is expected to go higher. Violence erupted after protesters took to the streets responding to the Muslim Brotherhood's call for a day of rage following the death of 683 people yesterday. Nell Ayed has the latest. With a combustible day looming, the military dispersed widely. So did word that security forces had permission to open fire should things get out of hand. On Fridays in Egypt, things have a habit of getting out of hand. And this wasn't any Friday. The Friday of rage, the Muslim Brotherhood called it. We will not leave the squares, he says. We are here because of our brothers who died. We want to bring them justice. Some of the hundreds who died in Wednesday's ferocious crackdown were only buried today seen as martyrs in a struggle to undo the military overthrow of an elected but deeply unpopular president. Where is democracy? Where is our vote? Soon, in the thousands, they converged on central Cairo. Soon, the violence many feared broke out. Gunfire erupted in many parts, sometimes by police and also military. Casualties started mounting. The worst violence, though, was in Cairo's Ramsey Square, where at a huge gathering, a nearby police station was apparently attacked. That drew helicopters and a hail of bullets, some of it delivered by those plain-clothed policemen up there. At a nearby mosque, suddenly field hospital and morgue, the bodies quickly piled up. The few doctors quickly overwhelmed. This doctor says they had nearly 30 bodies and a very large number of wounded, it was only early afternoon. On local television, unverified images of what was reported as Muslim Brotherhood protesters with their own guns. Many policemen were also apparently killed today. The Brotherhood insists their protests are peaceful and will persist in Cairo and beyond. The Friday of Rage wasn't only a display of anger, but also to prove their presence. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. Canadians with family and friends in Egypt are closely watching what's happening. Many had high hopes for a peaceful transition to democracy. Ron Charles reports. During the Arab Spring of 2011, Nadia Alexan and her friend Nabil Malik were hopeful. The two Egyptian Coptic Christians living in Canada were happy to see the end of Hosni Mubarak's 29-year presidency. It's about time because uh, a dictatorship uh, is no good for the people, especially a corrupt dictatorship. Well, uh, Today, Alexan's hopes are all but dashed as she watches protesters set fire to Coptic churches. She says she is saddened by the deaths from the military crackdown, but she blames the recently deposed President Mohamed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood. The um, Muslim Brotherhood has hijacked the revolution, and uh, although they said they would be inclusive, uh, actually what they did is uh, they wanted to impose their own uh, uh, backward religious ideas on the whole nation. Egyptian Canadian Ahmed Deef couldn't disagree more. He too was once hopeful. Arab Spring. I During this CBC interview last year from Cairo where he was working with Morsi's new government. Uh, we are now free Egyptians who can decide for the future of Egypt. Now his hopes are dashed as well. Imagine after, after tasting the, 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 the sweetness of that and, and having all these dreams suddenly uh, you find uh, the, the military regime coming back again in its most wildest uh, uh, form, uh, in the form of a coup. But many people from Egypt who have lived in Canada for decades are on neither side of the conflict. They say they only hope their homeland doesn't tear itself apart. To actually see it escalate the way it has over the last few days is actually very saddening. It's, it's not a life, really. Uh, so hopefully it's going to end soon. But with no sign of when it will end, they can only watch and worry from afar about what's to come. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. A Nova Scotia woman is living a nightmare. Several months ago, she had a mastectomy that she didn't need. It was an unnecessary surgery, a difficult recovery, and she has questions nobody can answer. Today, she's speaking out. Yvonne Colbert has more. When I got the phone call saying that it was cancer, it just 
I, it just shook me. And that's because there was no history of cancer in her family. She'd had unusual mammograms before, but it was just calcium tissue. She was given two options and chose a mastectomy because she was told it would lessen the chance of cancer returning. But dealing with it was tough. Every time I changed, every time I got a bath, got ready for bed, I, I, it was just like, I can't believe I'm doing this. This can't be real. But it would become even more unreal almost two months later when she met with her surgeon, who told her the diagnosis and surgery were a mistake. She said the good news is you don't have cancer. Bad news is you lost your breast. So I was just stunned again. I worked in the healthcare field, and so I worked in the hospital, so I know about mistakes. But when she told me that the files had been switched, I just couldn't understand how that could happen. She says she has no physical pain, but... As I'm not complete, I mean, I'm not the same. And she is getting help to deal with the situation. Angry, afraid, afraid of what, afraid of ever having anything done again. Fisher was stoic throughout our interview and only became emotional when talk turned to her family. They've been really supportive. And I don't think I could have done it without them. Her sister Lynn was with her today as she has been throughout the ordeal, which she calls gut-wrenching. There's no going back. We can't get it. We can't take back any of what has happened since January or February of this year. It is her reality every day, the rest of her life. Fisher has hired a lawyer and plans to sue the hospital. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. More revelations today about the scope of eavesdropping by the U.S. government. The Washington Post says the National Security Agency broke privacy rules or overstepped its authority thousands of times. Artie Pohl has the details. Top secret documents and an NSA audit obtained by the Washington Post reveal the agency broke privacy laws thousands of times. The documents provided by NSA leaker Edward Snowden back in May show the agency was engaging in the unauthorized surveillance of Americans and foreign intelligence targets in the U.S. The audit, dated May 2012, shows more than 2,700 incidents in the preceding year. In a statement emailed to the CBC, the NSA says that number is above average, but there are a variety of factors that could cause a spike, such as the implementation of new procedures, changes to the technology or software in the targeted environment, or unforeseen shortcomings in their systems. The report indicates a majority of the violations were unintended, caused by either so-called operator error or people not following standard procedure. But in some cases, the violations were serious. The federal surveillance court that has jurisdiction over the NSA ordered it to destroy, after five years, all the uh, call data records that it gathers on innocent Americans. And it did not do that. In response to the report, the NSA says when there are mistakes in the carrying out of its foreign intelligence gathering mission, those issues are reported internally to federal overseers who then aggressively try to get to the bottom of it. Also, last week, U.S. President Barack Obama unveiled new steps in order to improve the oversight of surveillance. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. Most of us have had complaints about the state of roads here in Thunder Bay and across northwestern Ontario at times, but you may want to consider after you see this, because this is something you don't want to see on your morning commute. It may be the worst road in Russia right now. It's about 300 kilometers northeast of Moscow. It was heavily damaged by spring flooding. Road crews are still trying to fix the damage, but in the meantime, for those driving, better to walk. On the markets today in Toronto, TSX up another 32 points. It finished the week at 12,736. Dow dropped 30 points to 15,081. And the Nasdaq slipped three points to 3,602. The Canadian dollar fell a third of a cent. It closed at 96.72 cents US. Gold up $10 to $1,371 an ounce. And oil edged up 13 cents to 107.46 a barrel.
We talked yesterday about Canada's success, the World Track and Field Championships, more of the same today. Yeah, we're certainly not a powerhouse in track and field, but we continue to plug along. Canada has a fourth medal at the Track and Field Championships in Moscow. Dylan Armstrong this time, he won bronze in the men's shot put with a throw of 21.34 meters. It's the second medal in as many World Championships for Armstrong. The native of Kamloops, BC, won silver in 2011. Meanwhile, a shocker today at the Western and Southern Open Tennis Tournament in Cincinnati. Novak Djokovic's bid to become the first player to win all nine Masters events has been put on hold for at least another year. American John Isner, you remember he beat Milos Raonic yesterday. Well, he upset the number one seed 7-6, 3-6, 7-5 in the quarterfinals. The world's top-ranked player has never won Cincinnati, losing in the final four times. He won't make it there this year. The number two seed was also ousted today. Britain's Andy Murray fell in straight sets to six-seeded Thomas Burdick, 6-3, 6-4. Over on the women's side, Serena Williams cruised to a 6-0, 6-4 win over Simona Halep. The Toronto Blue Jays hope to carry their momentum into Tampa Bay this evening, fresh off a series win over division leading Boston at the Rogers Centre last night, where former White Sox teammates Mark Burley and Jake Peavy were the starting pitchers. Peavy on his game in this one as J.P. Aaron Sebia waves at this 3-2 offering to end the second. Fast forward to the top of the fourth. Boston gets on the board first. Jacoby Ellsbury grounder to second base. Jays can't turn the double play as Daniel Nava comes across. Red Sox lead 1-0. Burley, he gave up 10 hits through seven innings of work, but just the one run to go along with four strikeouts and a pair of walks. Really nice outing for Mark Burley. Bottom of the seventh now. Peavy facing Brett Lorry with nobody out and two runners on. Lorry gets the better of this at bat, firing a line drive to center field. Jose Bautista scores. This game is tied at one. That will end Peavy's night. He's replaced by Craig Breslow. Still in the inning, pinch hitter Mark DeRosa lifts a sack fly into the outfield. In comes Edwin Encarnacion. Jays take the 2 1 lead. They hang on to win the ball game by that very score. Burley picks up his ninth win. Meanwhile, it's the 22nd save for Casey Jansen. Boston still leads the AL East by two games over the Rays. The Blue Jays are 15 games out. Well, ready or not, here comes Max Hall as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers look for just their second win of the season tonight when they host the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Hall's set to make his first career CFL start, despite coming into the season as the number three man on the depth chart, the former Arizona Cardinal feels ready to seize the opportunity. In fact, he says he feels much more prepared than he did when he made his first NFL start back in 2010. I just have to play like, like this is my team and it's my turn to take over. In this season of uncertainty, it's now Max Hall's turn to attempt to remove the weight of losing that has attached itself to the Blue Bombers. Hall's playing days appeared over until offensive coordinator Gary Croton who recruited Hall once to play at Brigham Young, lured him north. And with the struggles the offense has had, it's hard to say who's under more pressure tomorrow night. Uh, obviously, I'm a humble person right now, and but at the same time, I know I'm a good football coach. I've won a lot of games. I've won many championships, and I think I can do it here. But can the Bombers do it with Hall, who did start three games in the NFL with the Arizona Cardinals in 2010? But besides a couple of exhibition games, has yet to throw a pass in a real CFL game. And how long will he be given to work out the kinks with Buck Pierce waiting anxiously to get back on the field? I can't really worry about that. I, I really can't. If I can't play looking over my shoulder wondering if the next guy is going to come in. So I'm not going to. He's had a lot of time to prepare himself mentally. And you know I think that's the biggest thing for him. Buck Pierce has also used the time this week to settle his emotions and reflect on what he has to do to be in the right frame of mind if he does have to take over from Hall. I'm a professional in any sense of of the way with that. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, you know, the situation's it's it's been handled. It's you know, it's it's in the past. Now we got to we got to move forward from it. While he's number three, Justin Goltz will be getting playing time when they go into their Wildcat formations. And though being a backup is not to Pierce's liking, it may be beneficial. He's had some durability issues, and as a backup, he's going to be healthy anytime he comes into the game. Of course, the hope is that Pierce won't have to play if Hall fulfills expectations. If I go out there and execute 
if I make my reads, if I get the ball out on time and we move the ball down the field, uh, you know, I won't have to worry about that. So I understand what we need to do and, um, you know, we're going to get it done. Heading west now where the BC Lions hope to leapfrog the Stampeders for second place in the division this weekend. But the Leos will have their hands full trying to contain the CFL's second leading rusher, John Cornish. In that war big time tonight. John Cornish up the middle. Goodbye. Touchdown. Make it three. Hat trick. John Cornish. With all due respect to Andrew Harris and all the other backs, John Cornish is the premier back in the Canadian Football League. His 175 yards rushing four touchdown performance against the Riders, earning him Canadian and Offensive Player of the Week honors. He ran all over and through the Riders as Calgary handed Saskatchewan its first loss. It's something he also did to BC back in week one. They are a very strong team and John is playing extremely well. There's no doubt what the philosophy is. There's no doubt that he's finding ways to make explosive plays. I mean, you take a look at his 53-yard run last week. You take a look at another run that's over 30. All of a sudden, you're looking, you're looking at the score sheet and he's got over 80 yards on two plays. So he's playing outstanding football, a tremendous amount of respect for him because it's not going to take one guy to get him down. It's going to take all 12 of us. You guys going to be the team to finally stop John Cornish? We're going to go out there and play BC line football. Our defense is going to run, hit, and be nasty, if that answers your question. <laughs> Four preseason games on the NFL docket this evening. Tom Brady's expected to get the start for the New England Patriots as they take on Tampa Bay. This, of course, coming two days after Brady appeared to injure his knee in practice, and all manner of panic ensued. The Minnesota Vikings, they're in Buffalo to take on the Bills. Four games last night, Chargers-Bears. Chicago looks really good early as Cutler hands the ball to Matt Forte. Big hole on the left side. He's off to the races. A 58-yard run for Forte. Brings up first and goal at the five. Brandon Marshall, my man, 118 catches last season. That's why. A strong catch in the end zone, victimizing Sharice Wright. 7-0 Chi-Town. Meanwhile, San Diego's starting offense. Not able to get anything on track. Third possession, left tackle Max Starks, free agent from Pittsburgh, absolutely whiffs on Shea McClellan, and the ball is out. Phillip Rivers puts it on the ground, recovered by Major Wright. The Chargers turned it over five times in the first half. So the Bears take over in San Diego territory. They would march right down the field, capping off the drive with a four-yard TD run by Forte. Bears up big. They hang on to win 33-28. to 28. Shifting over to Cleveland, meanwhile. The Browns offense looking good in the preseason. Brandon Whedon finds Josh Gordon along the sidelines. Later in the drive, Whedon hits Jordan Cameron in the end zone. Cleveland beats Detroit 24-6. It's Philadelphia over Carolina 14-9 as we see Michael Vick scramble and hit Riley Cooper for a 22-yard pickup. Over in Baltimore, where Joe Flacco hits his home run threat, Torrey Smith. He takes a quick slant and turns on the Jets, outracing Atlanta defenders. He's pretty quick. Ravens hold off the Falcons 27-23. to Back to baseball now. The Philadelphia Phillies have fired longtime manager Charlie Manuel. The 69-year-old led the team to a World Series title in 2008 and brought the Phillies back to the series in 2009. But this year's team is out of the pennant race and in a tailspin since the All-Star break. Manuel's replaced by Hall of Fame sec uh, second baseman Ryan Sandberg, the Phillies' third base coach. To Williamsport, Pennsylvania now, where Canada opened the Little League World Series against Chinese Taipei. The Canucks fall behind early after surrendering a hit and a walk in the first. Hurler Angus Adams facing Shi Chi Chu at the dish. He gets a hold of the 2-2 pitch and absolutely crushes it. A three-run bomb to straightaway center gets the Asia-Pacific representatives on the board. That was just the beginning. Canada falls 10-2 to Chinese Taipei. They'll take on the loser of today's Japan versus Europe and Africa game. That goes tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. So hopefully they have some better luck tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, uh, Tonight uh, on CKPR Thunder Bay, Mr. D, Jerry himself experiences what Barry uh, is known to happen every now and then. His dates get interrupted. Here's Teletalk. 
<laughs> Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, starting at 8, it's Bones, and a very pregnant Brennan investigates a body from a prison. Then at 9 on Hawaii 5 while on a fishing trip, McGarrett and Danny's boat is hijacked. And at 10, 16 by 9 takes a closer look at current affairs and the stories that affect Canadians. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay at 8 on Mr. D, Jerry's date is interrupted by an old friend. At 8.30, Ron takes a strict but fair look at parenthood on The Ron James Show. Then at 9 on The Fifth Estate, a daughter's quest to solve her mother's murder reveals family secrets. And at 11.35, George gets Southern fried with good old boy Billy Ray Cyrus. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists. We have been enjoying a beautiful week weather-wise. Uh, Matt, what is the weekend looking like? Yeah, it's going to be hit and miss. Tomorrow should be nice, but we could see a chance of showers and a thunderstorm uh, on Sunday. I'll get to that in just a second. In case you haven't noticed, it's three-piece suit day here on the TBT News set. Call Holly not taking part because, uh, well, she's way better looking and more stylish than all of us. So there you go. Uh, Thunder Bay, let's have a look. Today's high, 27 degrees. Mainly sunny skies again, as Holly just mentioned. A beautiful end uh, to what was a beautiful week. Uh, across the country right now. Vancouver, Prince George, not so fortunate at this point. Uh, 21 degrees in cloudy skies in Vancouver. Prince George, 18. They're seeing thunder showers uh, at this hour. Moving uh, into Edmonton, Calgary, 22, 25. But the heat, Regina, 33 degrees. Saskatoon, 31. It is a bit of a heat wave out in the prairies. Very much enjoying that. Uh, Oh, getting up there in the Humidex, making that feel even hotter than it is right now. Winnipeg at 30 as well, and Churchill 
at 22 degrees as we move into southern Ontario. Thunder Bay, still the warm spot across the province. As you have a look, Toronto, 22, Ottawa, Montreal, 22 as well, but they are seeing mainly sunny skies. Quebec City, 20, that's a bit of a break for them after the, uh, the weather they've been seeing lately as we move into the Maritimes. Fredericton, 21, mostly cloudy skies. Halifax, 18 degrees and sunny skies as I think it's going to move into the Maritimes. There we go. Now it's going to move into the Maritimes. Yeah, it's right. It's Friday. St. John's not so lucky. They're not having a great Friday at 12, 12 degrees uh, right now. But again, it is uh, mainly sunny. Having a look at that systems map, you're going to see this cold front moving through. It's going to cool things off a little bit for tomorrow, but with the low pressure system that's ahead of it, that's the string of precipitation that the region is going to see come Sunday. Going to be pockets, shouldn't be too bad uh, here and there, a chance of a thunderstorm across some of the region, but that's what uh, we need to be wary of come Sunday and not Sunday night into Monday. As we have a look at the region tonight, 17 degrees in Red Lake and Kenora. Uh, beautiful temperatures for the most part across the region moving into tomorrow. We're also going to have continued to have beautiful temperatures. Armstrong, 28. Big Trout Lake, 27. Could get a little cloudier as we get move into the earlier uh, stages of Sunday. But again, still beautiful temperatures right across the board. As we have a look at Thunder Bay at this hour, 25 degrees. Again, beautiful outside. It's been a beautiful week. You can't blame that on me. I, 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 I got here this week and it's been beautiful temperatures. So, you know, you make your own conclusions. Uh, wind, though, gusting up 18. 32 kilometers an hour it is gusting. So keeping things, uh, again, a little bit gusty out there. And that's going to continue uh, into tonight. A few clouds, but that wind will die down around midnight or so. Uh, 12 degrees, again, a little bit warmer than it has been uh, over the past few nights, which is always a good thing. I've hit you with some big graphics today. It's the golf ball, because tomorrow, great day to go golfing. As we have a look, 24 degrees uh, come noon. Four, uh, by 4 o'clock, it's going to be about 25. So again, another great day to go golfing. You might want to get uh, that in, because on Sunday, it is going to be just a little bit wet. And I'll explain that here in the five-day forecast. We are going to have a UV index of 7, so if we are going out to the golf course, going out to camp, wherever it may be, if you're outside, again, grab some sunscreen because you're going to need it. This is where that chance of a thunderstorm comes in on Sunday. The temperatures are going to remain beautiful, but Sunday night into overnight into early Monday morning is when we could see a chance of a thunderstorm. In the afternoon on Sunday is when it could we could have some showers as well, so be prepared for that. Uh, again, it's been nice. We've been spoiled, but that could happen. Monday, those showers are going to continue you. Again, the temperatures remain beautiful, 26 and 28 into Tuesday. We're going to see some humid X's up into the 30s, so again, be careful. But uh, again, beautiful weather right now, 27 and then uh, into Wednesday, 27 into the middle of next week, uh, going to remain very hot. That's coming up from the state, so hey, be prepared for that rain on Sunday, but again, temperatures are going to remain beautiful. On entertainment news, singer-songwriter Justin Hines will be taking the stage at the Italian Cultural Center next week. Brent Hawley has all the details in tonight's edition of Front Row Center. Well, hello, this is Front Row Center. I'm Brent Hawley, letting you know what's happening in the community of Thunder Bay once again. Mark this one down on your calendar. You're going to want to check it out. It's going to be a great concert, and it's for a great cause. There's a gentleman by the name of Justin Hines. He's coming through the city. He's actually doing a North American tour, and he's going to be performing at the Italian Cultural Center next Tuesday, August the 20th. He's a great storyteller. He's a great Canadian singer-songwriter, and all of his proceeds from this tour are going to support various local charities on his tour. So in Thunder Bay, all the money that he raises is going to the March of Dimes. Now, tickets are only 10 bucks, and you can pick them up at a variety of locations throughout the city, including the Baggage Building Arts Center, the March of Dimes itself, the Painted Turtle, Print Pros Plus, the Thunder Bay Transit Office, or you can call for more information and for tickets, 345-6595. Get your tickets today. Front Row Center is brought to you by Teleco. We hear you at Teleco, your T-Bay Tel authorized dealer, 601 Central Avenue. All right, we've all suffered at one time or another from jet lag, but we now have a novel new way to combat it. All you need is a real big suitcase. Details when we return.
we've all been there. So tired after a long flight, you could sleep just about anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this young Russian girl didn't hold back, completely passing out on her dad's suitcase. The girl is getting an early 15 minutes of fame. The video is one of today's internet favorites. You can see why. It's truly really amazing. Was, I don't know whether you can hear the background noise at home from the video, but the, the entire terminal was just lighting up over this, and the fact oh, that yeah. she could sleep through that is amazing in and of itself. Oh, yeah, no kidding. She must have been no really kidding. tired. No kidding. <laughs> in uh, news tonight, a uh, Thunder Bay man is once again claiming harassment from the Thunder Bay Police Force after going through more than 20 encounters over the past couple of years. It's a case that is now under investigation. And that's all the time we have for you this evening. Have a great weekend.